And the next talk is Stalin, gamma ray emitting narrow line sleep at one galaxies. Okay, so I'll be talking about these gamma ray emitting narrow line ciphers. So this talk was actually scheduled for 17, 17th October. So <coughs> because of some constraints, we have to pre pawn for today. So, so now so when you go to the gamma ray sky, as looked by Fermi, a majority of these sources are are the blazer class of objects. And when you see the distribution based on two years of observations from Fermi, you see more or less a uniform distribution with comprising sources of flat spectrum quasars and BLAC objects. And prior to the observations of, okay, this is how the broadband SCD of a uh, blazer looks like where the low energy peak is based on synchrotron process and the high energy hump is on inverse Compton process. So much before the launch of Fermi, so people try to constrain the physical parameters of sources based on non-simultaneous multivalent data. And after the launch of Fermi and with the availability of many space-based and ground-based telescopes, now we are able to have a better handle on the properties of the sources by fitting the broadband SCD. But still, I would mention that in terms of observations, we lack really simultaneous data to do this SCD model fitting to understand the nature of sources. But now, going to the census of sources discovered by Fermi based on two years of observation, this is how the <coughs> chart looks like. About 57% 50, of sources are blazers. And there is a small 1% fraction comprising non-blazer active galaxies. So among this 1% of non-blazer active galaxies, Fermi has detected gamma ray emission from about a half a dozen narrow lens efforts. So this was not expected before. And now coming to the, what these narrow lens effect galaxies are. So these sources were classified as a new category in 1985 by Osterberg and his group. And coming to the observational characteristics, they have the full width of maximum lines less than, or the lines less than 2000 km per second. The O3 by H beta is less than 3. They are powered by low mass black holes of the order of 10 power 6 to 10 power 8 solar masses. They have high accretion rate and they are hosted by spiral galaxies. So what is shown on the right is the comparison of the spectrum of an Ireland seaford with respect to other seafords. So what is shown on the middle panel is the typical spectrum of a seaford one source where we see the broad H beta line and the associated narrow four button lines. What is shown on the top panel is the spectrum of a cipher 2 where we have both the broad and the, um, both the permitted and the forbidden lines of similar width of narrow and narrow size. And what is shown on the bottom panel is the spectrum of a narrow line cipher. So when we concentrate on the width of the broad lines, the width is smaller than the typical um, broad line cipher but larger than the cipher 2. And just for comparison, I have shown the optical spectrum of a BLAC and a flat spectrum quasar. So now, coming to the classification of AGN, the normally a parameter which the R, which is the ratio of the flux at 5 gigahertz to the optical B band is normally used. And sources having R more than 10 are called as radio loud. Whereas sources with R less than 10 are called radio quiet. So now coming to the other properties of sources, radio loud have high mass black holes, they low accretion rate and have large scale jets. In the case of radio quiet, R is less than 10, they have low mass black holes and they do not have relative <coughs> jets. Now in the initial days of narrow lens seaford galaxy research, people thought these narrow lens seafords are mostly radio quiet sources. And observationally, they are known to have low mass black holes. So now, comparing the properties of narrow lens ciphers to that known for radio quiet quasars, the inference what people drew was, since narrow lens ciphered galaxies are radio quiet AGN, the, the young black holes undergoing rapid growth by accretion cannot produce relativistic jets. This was the idea soon after the discovery, soon after the known population of these narrow lens ciphers. But what 
the changes in the last 10 years is that similar to AGN, these narrow lens effects are also found to show this radio loud radio quiet dichotomy. However, the fraction is very less of the order of 7 percent compared to 15, uh, 15 percent what we know in in quasars. Now, when people try to look into the properties of these radio loud narrow lens efforts, they found three properties of radio loud narrow lens efforts are similar to blazers. However, they differ on other two parameters. So, when you talk about the radio spectra, the radio loud narrow lens efforts have a flat radio spectrum. And in terms of morphology, they have a core jet structure. And some of these radio loud narrow lens efforts also show superluminal motion. The two properties where they differ from conventional blazers is that they have low mass black holes and they are hosted by spiral galaxies whereas blazers are hosted by elliptical galaxies. However, after the launch of Fermi in the year 2008, the first discovery of gamma ray emission came in 2009 on this source, PMNJ0948 plus 0022 and what is shown here is the counts map of this source. And soon after the report of the detection of gamma rays, people also found strong optical polarization in the source. And these observations clearly led to the conclusion that these radio loud narrow lens effect galaxies also possess relativistic jets. So, so this is this was the story in 2009. So, what we try to do here is we want to try to see what the other properties of these sources are because we know that these sources are emitting gamma rays. Not only they are emitting gamma rays, their gamma ray flux is also found to vary with time. And they have a flat radio, uh, flat radio spectra and they have a uh, combat radio morphology. So, if that is the case, these we want to see if the other properties of these sources are similar to blazers. So, we try to focus on these three important properties. The first question we try to ask is what is the intranet optical variability of the sources because we know very clearly that blazers show large amplitude variability within a night. The amplitude of variation is of the order of always more than 3 percent and they also have high duty cycle variability. So, we want to see if these gamma ray emitted narrow lens efforts also show this property. The second thing which, which we try to ask is how, how does the gamma ray spectrum of these sources look like because Soon after the launch of Fermi, people found that in the case of BLAC objects, the gamma ray spectrum is explained by a power law behavior, whereas flat spectrum quasars deviate from the power law pattern and most of the time they are explained by a log parabola model. The third question we try to ask on these sources is that what is the nature of their broadband SCD? So, I will quickly move on what we got on all these uh, questions we pose here. So, to address the first question what we did? We monitored three of because this is the thing which drives our question because for blazer for all the quasars we know that BLX have a high duty cycle of around 70 percent. So we want to see if these gamma ray emitting narrow lens efforts also show such large amplitude variability. So with this idea we just monitored three objects over 10 nights and we found that all the objects showed more than 3 percent variability and the duty cycle is also of the order of 85 percent. So from optical variability studies, it is clear that these newly detected gamma ray emitting narrow lens efforts are similar to blazers. But among blazers, whether they are similar to flat spectrum quasars or BLX, we could not do because we have just 10 nights of data monitored on three objects. Maybe in future when the sample size gets increased, based on variability also we will be trying to see whether it is on the flat spectrum type or BLX type. So now coming to the second, so <coughs> these are the results. So, what is shown here is the differential light curve between two comparison stars present on the same CCD frame. These two panels are the differential light curve of the narrow lens effort with respect to the comparison star and this is how the full width half maximum changes over the night. So, from optical variability nature it is very clear that gamma ray emitting narrow lens efforts are similar to blazers. Now, coming to the gamma ray spectral properties. So, what is shown here is the gamma ray spectrum from Fermi. And what is fitted here is the, the red is the power law, law and this is the log parabola model. So, what we found that in, in most of the sources, the gamma ray spectrum is explained by a power law pattern which is similar to what we know from the flat spectrum quasars in the Fermi sample. 
Now coming to the broadband spectral energy distribution, so what is shown here is the broadband SED of two of the two narrow, uh, gamma ray emitting nylon ciphers. And here these red points are the simultaneous observations and the green points are the archival observations. And these broadband points are fitted with the one zone leptonic model. And what we found, the broadband SED of these sources are also similar to flat spectrum quasars, wherein the high energy component is explained by a standard Compton process. And the seed photons in this case is the photons coming from the torus. And since the, so from in terms of SED also, the, these sources are more like the flat spectrum quasar type of AGN. So what is, what is done here, we have plotted the uh, spectral index versus the, versus the lum, gamma ray luminosity. And for comparison, we have plotted a flat spectrum quasar 3C454.3 and a BL like object Mercury 421. So what is inferred from this figure is that in terms of gamma ray luminosity, these gamma ray emitting narrow ciphers span a complete range in between flat spectrum quasars and BLX. However, if you talk in terms of the spectral index, they have a steep spectral index similar to flat spectrum quasars. So in this spectral index versus luminosity plane also, these narrow end ciphers are, are occupying the position occupied by flat spectrum quasars. So now to conclude, so in, the, in terms of intranet optical variability, the properties are similar to quasars. SED is also similar to flat spectrum quasars. And at least one source is also found to show uh, large polarization. So the conclusion from this thing is that gamma ray allowed narrow end ciphers are nothing but the low mass black hole counterparts to flat spectrum quasars, but they are hosted in a spiral galaxy. So with this discovery, now we have three classes of gamma ray emitting sources, namely blazars, radio galaxies, and a new class of gamma ray emitting AGN. So what is the inference? So elliptical jet paradigm, which is normally talked about, is an observational bias. So galaxies do have relativistic jets, irrespective of their morphological class. And probably we are beginning to probe a new regime of relativistic jets if you observe more such sources of narrow and ciphers. And this is a comparison of what we know before Fermi and what we know after Fermi. So in terms of galaxy morphology, it was known that <coughs> these radio loud are in elliptical. Jet sources are in elliptical galaxies, but after Fermi, we find that spirals are also hosting latency jets. And what we go from here is just, a, it's just away from the talk. So this kind of SCD modeling requires nearly simultaneous data. So India has recently launched a multivalent astronomical satellite on, on 28. October. It consists of twin UV, UV telescopes and there are other X-ray payloads. So the Indian Institute of Astrophysics is involved in delivering these twin uh, UV imaging telescopes. So as of now, things are working properly. So what we try to address is that with this telescope, with the observations from this telescope, the availability of Fermi already in um, sky and properly coordinating with various space and ground based telescopes, we are able to, we are trying to tackle, uh, absorb few blazers, having near simultaneous data, fit the SCD, and the main motivation here is to constrain the location of the gamma ray emission region. So, I stop here. Thank you very much. Sorry, sorry, September. September. <laughs> Thank you very much. Um, okay, we've got time for some questions. Um, hello. So I'm interested in knowing uh, if uh, any polarization signatures could be obtained for these uh, narrow line seaford galaxies in both radio and op optical. I know you no. said that one showed. A yeah, right now, right now, polarization information has been known for one narrow line seaford. Okay. So the polarization observed is of the order of 18 percent. So they are really highly polarized in the ray opticals. And and what about the environment of these galaxies using spectrograph or you know to try to get a handle of uh, yeah, that environment is really not looked into it. So, uh, what kind of environments they reside? So, one has to directly look into the environment of a sample of blazers and then check with the sample of nerve and ciphers. And then one can check whether is there any environment effect on this. Right, because that could also help in distinguishing one way or the other if they belong to the FSRQ type. Yes, so that is that that information is not there. Okay. okay, thank you. See this. <coughs> This your uh, uh, narrow line ciphered galaxies you said, I mean, it's clear that there are relativistic jets present. 
Yes. But none of these relative jets are uh, showing large scale jets. No, no, they are, they are not. They are not showing. Large but there is a population of spiral galaxies which yes. is showing large scale jets. Yes, yes. What do you think is the connection between these two? Do you think there is any connection? Like, mm. is there any link between these two? Have you ever thought? Yo, no, I'm not. I, ca I cannot comment on like that. What could be the parent population of gamma ray uh, emitting Cifred one galaxies? Like, if you <laughs> see them <laughs> not along the jet, would they look okay. like this? Okay, no, I have not talked. So maybe okay. there's a clue. Somewhere there is a clue like that. Yes. You said uh, could be. Could be. Mm -hmm. Parent population of Nair. Of this, Nair yes. Ciphered one calculator. Right, right. On the, on the spiral host galaxy, actually, we don't have information for the gamma ray uh, loud uh, host galaxy. Mm -hmm. There is a one tentative for 1H0323, that is the closest yes. one, but the HST image is not, uh, uh, cannot say actually that it's a spiral one. Yes. The other sources have a higher redshift and there is no information in the morphology. Mm -hmm. We are applying for getting VLT data for the southern one, that is even closer, but uh, so far, we cannot say that they are hosted in spirals. So the yes. narrow line ciphered one hosted in lenticular in S0. So we actually do not know. Agreed. So with the same idea we had, uh, we had a failed proposal in GTC. We also submitted a proposal in GTC to uh, um, image the 1H0323 plus 342. That was the main target which we tried. Some of the proposal could not go through, so, but we are still trying to I get some deep imaging observations of these sources to really pinpoint this issue. Is the host galaxy of these sources are really spirals? Or, so we want to we are on into this game. For that uh, duty cycle determination? Mm. No, no, it's, do, it's, no, it's not three percent. Okay, in the case of narrow line galaxy, whatever galaxies we observe, always they show more than three percent of variability. It's, it's this observation, so the variation is more than 3%. Okay, so, so it is the total number of nights observed on how many nights it's variable. Okay, I think we'll have to stop there. Oh, sorry, you didn't get one before, so please. I just have a comment. I just wanted to point it out that uh, please handle these definitions with care. People are assuming that be a lack of, there is a difference between the spectrum, gamma ray, at least gamma ray spectrum, mm. Which, uh, observed by Fermi for BL lack object and flat spectrum radio quasars. This is not the case uh, because in BL lack objects, we have three different categories uh, uh, the low synchrotron, intermediate synchrotron, and high synchrotron peak blazars. And if you compare the spectral properties, not only the break, but the variation of the break and the, the, uh, the, the variations during different flaring epochs. There is absolutely no difference between the spectral properties of flat spectrum radio quasars and low synchrotron BLAC -like objects. Agreed. So, so actually, so in the, in to be taken into account. Agreed, agreed, I, agreed. So, in the in the first two years of Fermi operation, so when they when they published the gamma ray spectrum of flat spectrum and BLAC -like objects, this was the observation thing. Flat spectrum BLACs -like are explained by a power law pattern, whereas flat spectrums have a curved curved uh, spectral behavior. But what we have found recently is that BLX also show this behavior. So we are we are not published the research. So this definition, what I told, is only based on Fermi second year information. But when we are analyzing a seven year of data set, we have found that both behavior in both sources. And at times we have also found during some time the spectrum is also changing. So in two years of data, it is having a power law pattern. After some time it is going a different pattern. So this this uncertainty is there. <coughs> there is a recent catalog, third catalog, and everything is... Yes, actually, we, actually we, we based this analysis based on the third catalog. So we have looked into the third catalog and generated the gamma ray spectra of all the blazers. So whatever I told is based on this work which is going on. So there we find varied spectral behavior in terms of flat spectrum quasars and bean-like objects. So. Okay, we'll have to move on. Let's thank Stalin one more time.